In this video, I'll design a chat app like Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp. So let's get started. Following our regular system design template, let's first figure out the key functional requirements of a chat application. A regular chat application should have a one-on-one -on -one chat. It should have a feature of group chat, a read receipt feature, which means when you are sending messages to someone else, you should be able to get the double tick mark. You should be able to see the online status or share your online status with others. There should be a provisioning of notification. That is, if there's a new message waiting for you in your chat, there should be a pop-up notification. And then you should be able to share multimedia data, such as pictures, videos, GIF files, and whatnot. Coming to the system requirements or the technical requirements, one of the first things, the most important thing for any real-time chat application or a real-time, let's say, stockbroker application is low latency. Low latency is must for any real-time chat. The system should be also highly reliable and available. System should be able to serve both mobile and desktop clients, that is web interface. And the system should have storage for chat history. The system we design should be also able to handle huge amount of data, with text, photos, videos, etc. It also needs to have end-to-end -end encryption. And finally, the connection should be client initiated than server initiated. Here we are not using HTTP protocol because the user needs to send a request to the server. And once a response is received from the server, then the connection is closed. It means every message needs to wait for the full transaction between server and client. So the WebSocket protocol is used here because the connection is not closed immediately. In fact, here we are using the term WebSocket handler, which will be connected by the user. You can think of WebSocket handler as a lightweight server which keeps an open connection with all active users. Now having said about the limitation of HTTP protocol, there is still a way to use HTTP to get our desired behavior. There's a concept of long polling in HTTP wherein the server keeps the client connection open until a timeout or threshold has reached. You can check out my short video on long polling versus WebSockets to get a better understanding. Speaking of capacity planning, it requires feedback from your interviewer. In fact, sometimes they ask you to skip this part and do the actual design, and you don't need to spend too much time in this section. However, I would like to get some numbers out here. So in terms of traffic estimation, let's assume that we are dealing with a total of 500 million active users. And on an average, a user is sending 30 messages per day. So the total messages per day is basically 50 million into 30, which is 1500 million or 1.5 billion. Messages per day is equal to 1.5 billion by 3600 into 24. That is around 18,000 messages per second. As far as the storage is concerned, the total messages per day we saw is 1.5 billion. Considering each message is on average of 50 kilobytes, the total storage required to store all the messages would be 1.5 billion into 50 KB, which is about 75 petabytes of data. The only two API calls I can think of is send messages and get messages. So when you are sending messages, you send the user ID, the receiver user ID, and the text you want to send. And when you are getting the messages, you get by user ID, the screen size, or before timestamp. Just remember the API calls we are talking about here is from the user standpoint. That is the user machine will either send a message or it will receive a message. Given our functional and system requirements, now let's proceed and define all the services that will allow us to meet all our requirements. We'll have a messaging service, a relay service, a group service, a session service, a last seen service, and an asset service. Now let's talk about them individually at a high level, starting with messaging service. So when a user, say user A, wants to send a message to user B, he sends a request to the messaging service with the ID of user B. Now before this, user A establishes a persistent connection to the messaging service via WebSocket protocol because like we discussed earlier, it's a bi-directional connection. Now in a traditional HTTP protocol, the client needs to send a request every time when it requires some response. But in WebSocket protocol, the server can respond without any client request to be made. Messaging service identifies the user B via session service and sends the message accordingly. So how does session service works? Whenever a user connects to the messaging service, the messaging service tells the session service in which server the user has established the connection, which is stored in a database, more likely a NoSQL database, since you don't have any scope for relations between the data. Later, this information is used to send messages to the other end. Now, what if the user B is offline? In such cases, 
we need to temporarily store the message to deliver it lately. Message service forwards this message to the relay service in the occasion when the user is offline. The relay service will store the unsent messages, the from and the to user ID in a database like Cassandra. The last seen service is used to store the timestamp of each user. This information is based on logging of each user activity. The client side application should be intelligent enough to identify the difference between the user activity and the application activity itself and sends a signal to the app server. This information can also be used to show the online status of the users. Asset service is used to store and retrieve multimedia files in an object based storage or a blob store like AWS S3 bucket. And finally, we have a group messaging service, which is more like the messaging service, except we need to publish the message to all the users associated with the same group ID. This service will rely on the session service to identify the server to which each user is connected to. Now compared to other services, group messaging service is fairly complicated. And so we'll have a separate section to discuss more about group messaging. So let's move on to the database schema. Now the choice of database here can be RDBMS since we are dealing with more relations here. But again, you know, based on the situation, we can have a hybrid database with NoSQL in some cases, which I kind of mentioned earlier. So speaking of database schema, we'll have users with fields, user ID, username, and say maybe contact number. And then we'll have groups and each group will have its own group ID and the user ID of the user part of that group. Then we have unsent messages with fields, message ID, send from ID, send to ID, the content or the media URL. Say if you are sending messages such as video messages or PNG files, you send the location of that uh, PNG file in the form of media URL and the timestamp. You can also have a last seen table with the user ID and the timestamp. And finally, you have the sessions table, which basically maintained mapping of user ID with a server ID. What we discussed until now was how a personal chat works on a system like WhatsApp. But what about group chats? For every group created, we'll have a new group ID. And this group ID will have a mapping to all the users who are in the group. That is in the group mapping database. Now, groups will behave a little different from users because WebSocket handlers won't keep track of groups. It just tracks active users. So when user A wants to send a message to group one, WebSocket handler one gets in touch with message service. Message service will store the information to a queue or Kafka topic. Information such as which user is sending what message to which group. Basically, the message service will act as a Kafka producer. And then we'll have group message handler as our Kafka consumer, which will be listening to the Kafka topics. So whenever the message service posts a new message to Kafka topic, that is, user A is sending this message hello to group one. Group message handler will query group service to get all the users which are in group ID one. After it gets the list of users who are supposed to get the message, it now needs the respective list of machines those users are connected to, which it will get from the WebSocket manager. Once it gets the list of all the machines, the group message handler will send messages to individual machines by talking to the respective WebSocket handler. Again, WebSocket Handler is a lightweight server which keeps an open bi-directional connection with all the active users. And for whatever reason, if the receiver is offline, the message must be encrypted and stored in the server's database. Once the receiver goes online, all the messages can be delivered. Now, one last point on media files and storage. The images, files and videos that are sent over the chat should be compressed and encrypted at the device end. The encrypted content will be sent to the receiver and the content will be decrypted on the receiver device itself. So for instance, when a user A sends an image to another user B, user A will upload the image to a server and get the image ID. And then it will send the image ID to user B. User B can now search the image and download the image from the server. Or another method is the image itself will be compressed on the device side and sent to the asset service. The asset service can take the message and find out the type of message. Once the asset service detects the format of the message as media or image, it is stored in our blob store, which in this case is an S3 bucket. The links to the location of the media files can be stored in a SQL or NoSQL database with mapping to the user details. Now guys, there is no right and wrong design. As long as you can clarify the requirements with the interviewer, defend your design and make changes if any, you are all set. <laughs>